Hello, hello, welcome back to another video. So in this video, I'm going to try my best to break down investments into its most raw form. And when you understand its raw form, I think it will be easier to gain clarity on how to value an asset. And so to help everyone understand a little better, I've came up with this analogy. And so to me, every single company stock is like a $10 note or a $10 bill. And so obviously the value of a $10 note is $10. And if you pay any anything below $10, you're getting an undervalued asset. And if you pay anything above, you're getting an overvalued asset. Obviously, you would want to buy as low as possible. You wouldn't want to be paying $9.50 and hope to make a profit on that 5% difference. You would more likely want to purchase the $10 note at let's say $5 or $6 so that you can have a good margin of safety as well as better profit. However, of course, in the investing world, uh, it's not so easy. You, you you do not get to know that it is a $10 note and that's where the skill of valuing an asset comes in. It allows you to identify what note it is and from there you will know how much to pay. And so from this analogy, we kind of need to agree that the individual investor needs to know how to identify what note it is and that the market is actually selling the note at a different price. It could be $5, it could be $15, it could be $40. However, we know that it is a $10 note. However, of course, in real life, you won't know the exact value. Even if you're very good at valuing assets, you would most likely only be able to come up with a range because there are too many factors. However, one thing we need to agree on is that the market is selling these $10 notes at whatever price it feels like selling it at. It may or may not have any correlation to how much its underlying value is at, which is obviously $10 because it's a $10 note. And this is where investors will be able to make the difference of buying a $10 note at let's say $5 to $6. And to sum everything up from what I just said, we need to understand that there is mispricing in the market and basically opportunity in the market to purchase undervalued assets. Because if we do not agree that there is mispricing, then there is no point in doing any valuation because you're basically saying that the market knows what they're doing and they're basically tracking the value of every single asset available for investors to purchase. And now the second thing I want to talk about is the promise of high risk, high reward and low risk, low reward is a contradiction in itself. Because if let's say you know that this $10 bill is $10 and you purchase it at $2, obviously your risk in this purchase is very, very low because you bought it at an 80% undervaluation. And your gains on this is also likely to be very high, probably 500% because $2 times 5 is $10. And therefore, it is low risk, high reward. And on the flip side, if you purchase this $10 note at let's say $20, then your risk is very high of losing 50%. The probability that you will earn money on purchasing a $10 note at $20 is obviously also very low. Obviously, I'm not here to tell you that you can't profit off a $10 note that you bought for $20 because the next buyer might purchase it from you at let's say $22 or $25. However, in my opinion, the probability is likely to be lower than for example, if you were to purchase it at a lower price. And at that point, there is no point in valuing assets if you're going to purchase things for an overvaluation. And to me, that is not really investing anymore. And in the case where you purchase an overvalued asset, then it would obviously be high risk and low return. And so basically what I'm trying to get at is that if we want the highest returns, we need to buy the most undervalued asset and not chase after high risk, high risk, high reward items. Like for example, buying a lottery ticket. Because if I'm not wrong, most lottery tickets have a return on dollar of around 0.3 to 0.7. Meaning to say for every dollar you put in, you're likely to get between 30 cents to 70 cents back. And so it is very high risk for very low reward, in my opinion. I think in the recent, let's say one decade-ish, a lot of younger investors have been told to basically purchase the S&P 500 or an index fund to just write out the market and dollar cost average into it and that in the long run, it would likely outperform most individual investors or retail investors as well as hedge funds and whatnot. And I think that we really need to understand why 
equities, index funds, or S&P 500 funds actually appreciate over time, even if let's say you buy at the peak. Because in my opinion right now, it is overvalued and it is the equivalent of let's say purchasing a $10 note at let's say 18 to even 20 plus dollars. And so in my opinion, the S&P 500 ETF or index funds will likely have a big correction of let's say maybe 20 to 40% or more. However, it is only a high probability. It might not actually happen. And that is if earnings actually catches up to its overvaluation right now. Because if you think of an asset that let's say generates X amount of dollars every single year, and if that X amount does not increase, it does not make sense for the asset itself to increase in price as well. And so the fundamentals of why an asset actually increases in price is because the fundamentals or the earnings have increased and therefore the asset is now worth more. And when you purchase an overvalued asset, one of two things are very likely to happen. First is that the price of the asset falls to a point where it matches its earnings. And the second is that the earnings increase to a point where it matches the price you paid for the asset. And so in the very long run, the S&P 500 index is still likely to increase as long as businesses continue to increase their earnings. And that is where this whole DCA into index fund thing come about. And I think it's actually very important to understand why instead of just closing your eyes and uh, putting money into the index fund. Even though if you are someone that can really fully blindly trust something, then sure, I guess you save a lot of time on uh, research and you can use your time for other stuff, which is basically the whole point of investing anyways. However, I think it does not hurt to understand a bit deeper on why things actually work the way it is. And so my last point would be to actually ignore metrics that do not make any sense at all. Because I've seen recently uh, whereby people will say that, uh, for example, August is the worst month to purchase stocks because uh, it is historically going to do bad, blah, 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 blah. Or September is historically to do bad. Or whatever, um, in my opinion, nonsense statistics that people come up with. And I also have an analogy for this. Imagine if you flip a coin every single day from Monday to Sunday, 10 times and you record um, which days have more hits and which days have more tails. So over the course of a year, there will be days of let's say Monday is majority hits and let's say Tuesday is majority tails. So this statistic is basically useless because a coin flip is basically 50-50 and it does not matter which day you flip it on even though there is a track record of let's say one year whereby Monday is mostly hit. It makes zero sense, I would say, most of the time, unless you're telling me that uh, on Monday there is some extra gravitational pull towards tails and therefore the coin will turn up hit. If not, uh, it makes no sense. And it would be way better to actually find out what's the actual probability of a coin flip rather than to focus on if it's Monday or Sunday. And of course, in investing, these metrics do not basically scream, this is bullshit. You have to kind of filter things out yourself and try your best to think if it actually makes sense or not. And one way you can do it is to stretch things to the extreme to see if the metric actually makes sense or not. And in my opinion, if it is something as ridiculous as a Monday coin flip or a Sunday coin flip kind of thing, it would be pretty much very obvious to most people. And in my opinion, the real things we need to look out for is things that actually make sense. However, it does not have too much of an impact. And just to continue on with the coin flip analogy thing, is to imagine if you were flipping a certain type of coin and then there was a study to basically weigh the head side of the coin and the tail side of the coin to see which one is heavier and therefore would, for example, give heads a slightly higher probability of let's say 51% to 49% tails. These types of studies do indeed make sense. However, the impact is so small that in my opinion, it will not change too much of an outcome as long as you have a big enough margin of safety. So what I'm trying to say is to focus on 
actual important things that would affect the outcome of your investments. And to me, those are the earnings, the earnings growth, the balance sheet, and all these things relative to the price you're paying for. Long story short, to value the business and get a good price for the asset you're buying. And in my opinion, these four things combined would likely dictate about 90 to 95% of your investment gains or returns over the long run. And there will be other things that do make sense. However, it only contributes to a very small percentage of your investment returns. And so the key is to not get distracted by those things because those are the exciting things that, like I said, do not really matter that much. And so with that, I will say bye-bye and I will see you in the next one. If it helped or if it makes sense, please help to like the video. And if any part doesn't make sense or you would want some explanation, you can comment down below. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.